Welcome to Weather Extra. Thanks for joining us. I'm meteorologist Jillian Grace. What a wild and a busy week of weather across the entire nation. Two very powerful storm systems swept coast to coast over the last week, bringing tornadoes, landslides, powerful winds, heavy rain, and even multiple feet of snow. We get Weather Extra started by taking a look back at those powerful storm systems. We bring in meteorologist Deshaun Bellafuri to explain more on what took place last week. We may have just switched over from meteorological winter to meteorological spring, but already we have seen two pretty powerful storm systems move through the southern plains last week. The first storm system, I don't blame you if you don't remember it, didn't really impact our area. It moved its way into the panhandle, into Oklahoma, bringing an EF2 tornado uh, up to near Norman, Oklahoma, and in addition to some very strong wind gusts. That was the first system, but here comes storm system number two. This was the one that you all probably remember because it moved its way right through central Texas Thursday afternoon and evening. Now, both of these storm systems were pretty similar in their approach, but the reason why one of those systems impacted us and not the other, well, check out the trajectory of this first one spinning its way pretty much east and then northeast. Here's the area of low pressure at the bottom of uh, the area of low pressure right down here. That's a little bit too far to the north to really uh, get us into the severe weather zone. But one thing I do want to point out is the orientation of how this upper level low is. Normally these troughs are from northeast to southwest, but this one was from northwest to southeast, and that creates kind of a bottleneck in the atmosphere as winds round the bend. Once they get on the other side of that area of low pressure, they diverge. When air aloft diverges, it creates a hole in the atmosphere, and in order to get back into balance, you need to fill it in by getting lifting air, rising air from the surface, creating those intense thunderstorms. Now, this system was a little bit too far to the north, and of course, it was a little bit on the strong side too. But storm system number two, it moved in a little bit farther south, so that's why we got into the severe weather risk. But notice this was kind of a northeast to southwest normal tilt. That means, of course, there is still going to be lifting air, but not quite as intense as what we saw with that first storm system. The result, of course, a myriad of wind gusts, hail reports, and also tornado reports stretching from West Texas all the way up into the uh, Midwest. Reporting in the studio, Sean Bellafuri. KWTX News 10. And just as you heard from Sean, those powerful storm systems brought a wide variety of storm damage across the nation. Let's take a look back at some of the extreme weather and destruction that the first storm system brought to the U.S. Last weekend, nearly the entire state of California dealt with an unusual winter storm, bringing heavy rain and snow to places that haven't seen it in years. The first ever blizzard warning was issued by San Diego's National Weather Service as Southern California would go on to see historic snow, leaving thousands without power. Snow and heavy rain caused dangerous flooding and treacherous driving conditions, which forced major roadways to close. Last week in alone, around three to five inches of rain fell in parts of California, but that's on top of an already abnormally wet start to the year. Some higher elevated areas saw between three and six and a half feet of snow. In Ventura County, the fire department had to perform a water rescue as heavy rain caused floodwaters to quickly rise. And in L.A. County, three motorhomes were swept into a river after high water eroded an embankment. Storm system number one of the week would move east away from California and quickly raced across the central United States as a new work week began. More than 20 million people were under threat of severe storms Sunday into Monday from West Texas all the way into Illinois and Ohio. A line of severe thunderstorms raced through the plains Sunday night and brought large damaging hail and widespread wind gusts of 70 to 80 miles an hour to Texas, Oklahoma and Kansas. In Memphis, Texas, a 114 mile per hour wind gust was reported thanks to a microburst. Several destructive tornadoes tore across Oklahoma Sunday evening. One person was killed and more than a dozen were injured. An EF2 tornado swept through Norman, Oklahoma. There were several reports of catastrophic damage to homes and businesses. Cars were thrown around, numerous trees and power lines taken down by those powerful twisters. In Oklahoma, a new record for most tornadoes in the month of February was set this 
this year, with at least nine tornadoes alone reported on Sunday. As the storm system continued to move northeast across the nation, several tornadoes touched down in Illinois to kick off the work week. The National Weather Service confirmed two tornadoes in the Chicago area on Monday. The tornado threat continued into Ohio on Monday as well, where the National Weather Service said two confirmed tornadoes moved through the state. Thunderstorms also brought strong, straight-line winds that damaged trees and power lines. Some large hail fell, some even getting close to the size of baseballs. The storm system would continue on its path across the U.S. and head into the northeastern portions of the nation, where millions of Americans from New York City to Boston would see accumulating snow, creating slick and slushy roadways. Now totals were nowhere near like what the West Coast saw with this storm. Boston would see just under an inch of snow, over four for Providence, Rhode Island, Island, nearly five inches in Hartford, Connecticut, but New York City saw its largest snowfall of the season so far with 1.8 inches falling Monday into Tuesday. Across the higher elevations in the northeast, between eight inches and a foot of snow was recorded. As at first, the storm system moved through the northeast. Another one moved onto the west coast, bringing round two of rain, snow and tornadoes that would once again move across the entire nation. The travel headaches continued for Americans along the West Coast early last week as the second storm system brought more rain and snow to Oregon and Washington, but once again the state of California feeling the brunt of the storm. Heavy rain caused mudslides and sinkholes across the Golden State. Motorists stranded on closed highways, many residents trapped inside their homes as multiple feet of snow fell, some seeing accumulations up to their roof. Yosemite National Park was overwhelmed by snow and the the entire park had to be shut down as they had the task of removing 15 feet of snow off roads. Frigid air then moved into California in the wake of that storm. Freeze warnings were in effect last Wednesday and Thursday. The storm system would once again race east across the nation, which put millions of Americans under the gun for another round of severe weather and snow. Snow fell across Arizona, transforming the state into a winter wonderland. Many of Arizona's major cities seeing between two and four feet of snow. Power was knocked out for thousands, and many were left stranded on roadways due to poor travel conditions. Now, this was the first storm system of meteorological spring that produced tornadoes, hail, and even hurricane-force winds across the south, and that did include us right here in central Texas. Take a look at this hail that fell in Sherman, Texas. Large hail, sometimes up to the size of golf balls, slammed into cars and covered the ground in many neighborhoods. Tornadoes were reported across the Lone Star State as well, one tearing through the town of Picton, where law enforcement say at least 19 homes were damaged. And look at this video capturing a tornado touching down on the ground near Winsboro, Texas. Some downed trees and power lines were reported along with some roof damage to a home. Two tornadoes were confirmed across Louisiana, impacting communities of Shreveport and Alexandria. Several businesses and homes were damaged due to the twisters. The main problem with these storms were the strong, straight-line winds that moved in when these storms raced through. There were widespread wind gust reports of 60 to 80-plus miles per hour across Texas. In Grand Prairie, a wind gust of 87 miles an hour was reported Thursday evening. In North Fort Worth, an 80-mile-an-hour gust, and in Corsicana, 76 miles per hour. These winds were strong enough to knock out power to hundreds of thousands across Texas, tear down trees, flip and move trampolines down the the street and even knock over semi trucks on Texas highways. The storms raced through quick and were out of the Lone Star State Thursday night, but the threat of severe weather then shifted east as the powerful storm system continued on its destructive path. More than 60 million Americans were under their gun for severe storms on Friday. Another round of damaging winds, tornadoes, and flooding would hit the southeast. Early Friday morning, tornadoes reportedly moved through parts of Arkansas, where one local emergency manager said 20 to 30 homes were damaged or destroyed, but thankfully only minor injuries. Throughout the day on Friday, more than 5 million Americans were under a tornado watch, which included states like Alabama, Illinois, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Severe thunderstorms storms produced damaging winds, a few tornadoes, and heavy rain across the southeast throughout the last day of the work week. The storm system would race further northeast and run into colder air, now developing into a powerful winter storm that would go on to blast more than 12 states with wintry precipitation and high winds. Winter storm warnings and winter weather advisories were issued for the southern Great Lakes Friday and additional winter weather alerts up through the interior northeast from upstate New York into northern New England for the first 
first half of the weekend. The precipitation initially started as a cold, heavy rain that would gradually transition over into a wintry mix of snow, sleet, and freezing rain as temperatures drop behind the front. Strong wind gusts would create reduced visibility at times as well. Travel conditions into the weekend were a mess across the northeast. Welcome into this week's Degrees of Science. When we deal with severe weather and any types of weather, you'll get watches and warnings that'll be issued. But where those watches and warnings come from and what all work goes into it, most folks may not know. Well, this week we're talking with Jennifer Dunn, the Warning Coordination Meteorologist from the National Weather Service in Fort Worth. Jennifer, when it comes to all this, first of all, just what's the difference for folks that may not know the difference between a watch and a warning? Uh, even the word watch versus warning causes a lot of confusion between people and, and I'm glad you asked that because we do get that question often or we notice that there is confusion. So a watch essentially means that conditions are favorable for that type of weather to happen. So let's assume we're going to be talking about a severe weather event. So you get a severe thunderstorm watch or a tornado watch it means that conditions are favorable for those types of storms to begin developing probably within an hour or a few hours later, depending on where you are in the watch box. So typically for most people, what we'd say is it's okay to continue with your routine activities, what you need to do that day. If you know it's gonna be later, maybe plan on being home or being in a safe place by, by that time. But also as you continue to go through the day when a watch has been issued, continue to check on the weather a little bit more frequently especially if those skies are getting darker or you start to see clouds build. Start checking your local weather sources to see what's going on. So when you have a warning that's issued for your area, that means that there is an imminent or an expected threat for severe weather or a tornado in the area that you have been alerted. So this is your time to take action. Don't delay, take those safety and preparedness actions to keep yourself, family, friends, whoever you may be with safe. Take shelter, get away from windows, whatever is required for that threat in the area. So when we're kind of at the beginning of the event or everything's kind of getting going, we just like you said, watches come out first. They're more for a broad area. In your office, what all work goes into a watch coming out for your forecast area? A severe thunderstorm or a tornado watch in particular, um, even flash flood watches as well, but particularly for severe thunderstorm and tornado watches, it's actually a collaborative effort with the Storm Prediction Center that's located in Norman, Oklahoma. They will kind of send their proposal of a watch down to all the offices that are impacted because as you mentioned, they cover very broad areas, um, larger areas than a typical warning. And so we'll all get on a collaboration call together, look over the proposed watch, make any changes, talk about what we agree about, what we even may disagree about that we need to keep an eye on for later. And then once everyone's agreed, we'll go through the process to having that watch actually issued and disseminated out, whether it's on web pages, broadcast media, on the TV, on radio, and on no um, all hazards weather radio also. Well, now the storms are starting to form, stuff's becoming severe. What, what all process goes on in your office to mm -hmm. put out severe thunderstorm or tornado warnings? So organized chaos is how you can describe our office. Um, we really don't have a whole lot of people. I think people think we have about 20 to 30 people that come in and, and work this uh, severe weather events, but our office really only has about 15 to 17 meteorologists. So we probably have about half of that in during a severe weather event, just based on the number of, of workstations we can have. And everybody has an assigned role and it's up on a whiteboard. Um, so everybody knows who's doing what. If somebody's coming in later, they can look and see who's doing what, or they can look and see what a assignment that they are um, assigned to. So one of those roles, the one, most important one you could probably argue is the radar operator. And that's gonna be the person who has primary responsibility for watching the radar, analyzing, and making decisions about what warnings are needed when and where. Now we're gonna have a support role for that also. There's probably gonna be a second radar operator or somebody who's assigned kind of as backup uh, to that person, especially if they need to step away from the desk or grab something to eat, um, go to the restroom. We do still allow that when there are uh, warnings going on, but they're gonna have, they're usually gonna be operating some type of team format as well. So it doesn't necessarily mean that warning decisions are solely put the responsibility on one person. There usually is some team component with a second radar operator or maybe some others in the office as to what the best decisions for warnings is. 
Well, I'm glad y'all give restroom breaks and food breaks because when everything gets crazy here, we we don't get that. <laughs> I'm stuck on the wall. I do feel bad for y'all for that. <laughs> and, and, you know, it is funny because people will ask us, you know, how many people you got covering? Well, there's only we only have four meteorologists. There's a lot of times I'm the only one in here. Everyone else is running around. Uh, keeping an eye on uh, the storm. So yeah, I think uh, controlled chaos is probably the uh, best definition for that. To hear more on Brady and Jennifer's conversation, head on over to our, our website, kwtx.com slash degrees of science, or you can just scan the QR code on your screen right now. Weather Extra will be right back after this quick break. Welcome back to Weather Extra. NASA is shifting its high-tech resources to gather more data on how our planet is changing. Senior National and Environmental Correspondent Ben Tracy takes us inside the space program's new Earth-focused missions to help us better understand our rapidly warming world. And lift off. When you think of NASA, this is probably what comes to mind. Shuttle launches blasting astronauts into space, high-powered telescopes capturing otherworldly images, and rovers exploring far-off planets. But with our own planet now undergoing dramatic and devastating changes, NASA is turning its eyes back towards Earth. NASA is the tip of the spear for climate change. Randy Friedel is Deputy Director of Earth Science at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. He points to NASA's new Earth System Observatory, a series of five advanced satellite missions that will monitor nearly every aspect of our planet, from bedrock to atmosphere. We turn with a renewed focus to our home planet of Earth. It will give NASA a 3D view of how the Earth systems are operating and impacted by climate change. Are you kind of looking at the vital signs of planet Earth? That's exactly what we're doing. And really looking at the heartbeat of the planet. Just a, a whole host of things that we are tracking every single day. And the liftoff. In December, NASA launched a rocket from California carrying a satellite called SWAT, which stands for Surface Water and Ocean Topography. This $1.2 billion mission is the first radar to survey almost all of the world's surface water, nearly every ocean, river, lake, and stream on the planet. Basically, this thing can survey 6 million bodies of water every three weeks? Yeah, that's right. It can cover everything. So. Project scientist Paul Rosen says SWAT will help to better detect and plan for floods, droughts, and rising seas, which are expected to make many coastal areas around the world uninhabitable in the decades to come. And this is a NASA animation of its upcoming mission, NISAR, scheduled to launch next year in a joint project with India's space program. The satellite will use two different radar systems to track subtle changes in Earth's surface to less than a half inch. This will allow better detection of ice sheet collapse and the melting of glaciers. It will track deforestation, which contributes to global warming, and also monitor groundwater supplies and even soil moisture, which can help predict the risk of wildfires. So this is a pretty impressive piece of machinery. It's unprecedented, and we're covering all of the land and the ice-covered surfaces every 12 days twice, once when the satellite is going up towards the North Pole and once when it's coming down towards the South Pole. We had to suit up. I look all right? Good to go. Good to go? Yeah. All right. And get any dust particles blown off of us before they would let us in here. This is the big clean room, high bay two. NASA's so-called clean room where they're testing NISAR's sensitive mechanics. This is it. Before shipping all of this nice. over to India next month. Is this the most advanced radar NASA's ever put up into space? Yeah, I'd say by far it's the most advanced radar. And NASA plans to share the data from all of these missions with scientists and governments to better understand and adapt to climate change. So you've been working on this for more than 10 years. Yes. How excited are you to get this thing up there? Words cannot express how excited I am to get this thing up there. It's very exciting to me. And it's one more set of eyes in the sky NASA will have staring back at Earth.
Ben Tracy, CBS News, Pasadena, California. A spectacular atmospheric phenomenon that has to be seen to be believed resulted in a rare and welcome mid-air flight diversion. Jeremy Roth says, take a look at this. The Northern Lights were in rare, remarkable form recently as the cascading colors were enjoyed by folks all over the planet and beyond. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. First, take a look at the view in Alaska, where glimpses of the phenomena, which are produced by electromagnetic waves during geomagnetic storms, are less rare, but certainly no less breathtaking. Look at that. In the UK, the Grassholm Observatory shared a time-lapse video of the aurora a rolling across the sky, an event the observatory says is only visible a few times a year. An Air Baltic flight was treated to a vivid view high above the Baltic Sea, and they weren't the only flight to sight the lights. Images from at least two passenger flights went viral after the pilots made unscheduled mid-air loops in order to give folks on board plenty of chances to take in and take pics of the amazing views. But the money shot has to be from one Twitter user with a very enviable vantage point. Astronaut Josh Cassida shared this stunner from the International Space Station with a caption that read, absolutely unreal. And here are some pictures of our very own Chief Meteorologist Brady Taylor last week as he was visiting a group of amazing fourth graders at Gatesville, Interme Gatesville Intermediate School for Project Tornado. Now, Project Tornado is a program put on by the KWTX weather team to teach Central Texas kids storm safety. So when severe weather strikes, kids of all ages know how to stay safe. Teachers, if you'd like to, for one of us to come to your school, you can fill out the form on our website. Go to kwtx.com slash weather and click on the Project Tornado form and request a visit. And I think I can speak for all of our weather team, but Project Tornado is definitely one of the highlights of our job. All right, that's all we have for you for this week's Weather Extra. I hope you have a great week. See you next weekend.